Uh, can I ask uh, Krishnava to please make his comments? Hello. So after all that, when you see Netflix, you have some button called recap. Unfortunately, you don't have the option to do skip recap, which we all do. Uh, so I'll try to, uh, well, from the prism of a lawyer, I, I think governance is, from a jurisprudential sense, uh, one of the most fascinating subjects, uh, both as a practitioner and as a learner of uh, governance. Uh, but it becomes even more fascinating when it's with the family business, and I'll, I'll just go quickly uh, through. So basically, the earliest uh, you know, construct of governance, and which is still a predominant construct of governance, of course, the Companies Act has widened the scope, but a predominant construct of governance is effectively the fiduciary responsibility of the board towards the benefit of the whole shareholders as a whole or a company as a whole. I mean, that's the, the main construct is the balance between the beneficial ownership, which is the shareholders, and the legal control, which is the board or the management, and how you reduce the agency cost. So against, so, so basically the, it was always the factor, and this is a Western uh, philosophy, not only Western, actually, if you look back at our trust act, where they say the directors are fiduciary, there is a whole, uh, you know, fiduciary obligations. And this is the basic construct of uh, governance. It is against this background where most failures have happened. And I think uh, Mr. Harish mentioned something uh, that family businesses don't have uh, too many governance failures. And he's absolutely right. Because if you look at uh, the world over, it is where the legal ownership or beneficial ownership is different from the management because the skin in the game of people who control it are so much lesser. That's why there are far more governance failures in the West uh, where the larger companies are predominantly diversified shareholding. Closer home, the two immediate uh, examples we can think of is Satyam and Island FS. And if you look at the shareholding of the promoters, there were none. So in some sense, family businesses are really um, auto-hedged against governance failures because you're aligned anyway to that extent. So it's a, it's a fact that uh, one family business who holds a significant amount of share will not ideally uh, defraud itself because if it does defraud, it would be. So that's one. Of course, there are other forms in terms of uh, creditors and all that, but I'm saying generally in the world of uh, corporate governance, that's the... Uh, failure. Now what is interesting, while in the normal sense of governance there are two rings of influence, which is the shareholders and the board. Okay, Family businesses obviously makes it a third ring. So there are shareholders, there are boards and then there are family. Okay, A derivative of that today in Bangalore as we see the most is a startup business. Okay, where you have the startup founders who have significant minority significant or something and then you have uh, the other shareholders who are private equity funds or investors, and then you have uh, the board, okay? And, and, and they are actually in terms of from one circle to the three circles of influence is what we understand. And the central theme as we understand today, as I said, was with the board and sometimes with the KMPs. And breach of these remedies in, in jurisprudential sense, breach of these fiduciary responsibility or fiduciary obligation, would land up in uh, uh, disgorgement, clawback, and in some extreme cases, even incarceration, as we've seen in, in India very recently, where promoters have been put behind jail. Now, this, this whole thing of management and board actually took a huge change 20 days ago in the world of jurisprudence. It somehow, I was just saying, it's gone under the radar, is in a judgment passed in the Court of Chancery in Delaware, in the Tesla's case of Elon Musk. And I think it's just that that is so relevant for today's conversation. And I'll quickly tell you uh, why. What the court effectively said was that, you know, it was by Richard Tornetto, a shareholder, came and said $55.8 billion okay, of grant, which was supposed to be made to Elon Musk in 2018, was reversed. The defense was that every single corporate consent, 
NOC's architecture was taken. So what's the problem? So I have taken the majority of the minority shareholders consent, I've taken the board consent, I've taken independent directors consent, I've taken regulators consent, I've taken every consent that I've had to take. So where is the problem? And this is where very fundamentally the fiduciary responsibility, which is usually on the board, the court said there has to be, and I'll just quote it. It says this whole concept of, I mean, I'll just quickly come to the, I'll tell you the facts for two minutes to say. So basically in 2018, there was a $55.8 billion grant only to Elon Musk, which would have made him the richest man in the world for centuries. I mean, by far, if that would have happened. because And there were few milestones. The milestones were a 12 tranche every billion dollar milestone, every 50 billion dollar milestone of the market cap. So there were market capitalization milestone and there were operational milestones in terms of EBITDA and revenue. And there were market cap milestones. So every time there was a 50 billion dollar, he would get a tranche. All of that would you know, convert into a, a total amount of 55.8 billion dollar. Passed by every single authority construct that you can pass by. It was above board opinions, everything taken. But it was filed by one um, shareholder, a minority shareholder, though there was a majority of the minority there also. And the construct which moved from there was on the fact they said there are two things. One was it questioned adequate disclosures. You mentioned communication, you know, because in the what we call the explanatory statement or the proxy, what they call it, they did not say that seven out of the 12 or 10 operational milestones were already achieved. Okay, and the independence of the directors, they say, are they truly independent? Be that as may, what, what I'm trying to say is that this whole construct of corporate governance being the bastion of the board, and he said that when a controller or a shareholder who controls displaces or neutralizes a board's power to direct corporate actions, the controller, even if he's a minority shareholder or a promoter or the CEO, superstar CEO, assumes the fiduciary obligation. So, so effectively, the fiduciary, and that's going to be a massive change in the world of jurisprudence of corporate governance, because we've always discussed it's the board which has the, you know, the fiduciary responsibility. This is the first time, I mean, not the first time because there has been Delaware laws earlier, Starport and all, but where India, as we know, corporate governance narrative in India has always followed what flowed from the West. Not for any other reason, because West as a market is a far more mature market. India is going that same way, the startup culture. The startups, not culture, the startups that we have. Some you know, extraordinary individuals who've come up and, and, and do that. And I feel that's going to be the narrative. Where the promoter or the family business so he says that, you know, how do you decide control? Just because Musk has 21% shareholder, as you said, that the promoter is larger than life, comes to the board. Just that the Musk is a 21% shareholder, does he have mathematical control? Need not be. But the fact that he comes to the board and, and, and it is Elon Musk, itself is a, is a significant ring of influence. And therefore, what happens is that whether family business or a derivative of family business, We've got to be conscious exactly, as I said, recap. Everything that they said from a jurisprudence prism. What I'm, I'm saying the same thing with this case, what Elon Musk, which actually changes. I mean, from a world of corporate governance, this is a milestone judgment, which happened for some reason. India's, India media has not taken over. But if you look at uh, Bloomberg and find they're all gaga over this judgment. But so the effective thing is, it's a simple thing in terms of fiduciary obligation, the transparency, the ethics, the related party, all has to be in the same manner because now just by saying, and we as lawyers have used this in court, business judgment rule. It, you know, courts should not interfere, business judgment. The courts will interfere eventually. The courts will come in and say that if you knew that these are the four directors who went with you for holidays, if this director was a large part of beneficiary for your investments in um, Tesla or your investment in Starlink, okay, he is no more independent. And those are the disclosures which you need to do. So disclosures become extremely important how you disclose, 
how you manage the communication part, how you communicate. I mean, the judgment meant about how the communication happened that everyone was gaga over Elon Musk. We are doing this for Elon. He said, why are you doing for Elon? It is for the company. And can you imagine a country where the richest man, $55.8 billion, by no means is it small for anyone, right? And that has been reversed by a court. However, based on the simple that even a family business or even a founder or a startup founder also, where world says only the board, no, you also, even if you're not in the board, would have a fiduciary responsibility to all the other shareholders. And I think that's the change which will happen. And hopefully there are, I mean, even SEBI, as we know, have been, uh, you know, bringing it this out. I mean, last year there was this whole regulatory change of Regulation 30A and 5 of the LODR, which says that all family arrangements now has to be disclosed. If family arrangements has an impact on um, uh, the shareholding or the or impact on the management, it has to be disclosed. So, so net net, uh, I, I think, as I said, I, I hope the recap was a small recap, but it was a very precise on exactly what they said. I just wanted to say there is a judgment. And very clearly, like in past, this judgment and this jurisprudence will flow to India. And they will and flow worldwide to say that promoters, startup founders, all of them also have a fiduciary responsibility to the other shareholders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those were some very good insights, I think, and a slight corollary to what we were talking about earlier. Thank you.